Tell me more. Patients of our education. It's like the last class before, you know, all this. Wave your hand if you think Tammy looks cold. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, announcements. We have making gloves, I guess, tomorrow. 7 a.m. we need help. And I'm sorry, but I'm running at least until noon. <laughs> Any others? Council meeting after church. There is a council meeting after church. And since people are here, we can vote them into an office. Yes. And the bazaar is going to go from eight to one. Yes.
Lord who is on our side, let Israel not say. If it had not been the Lord who is on our side when our enemies attacked us, then they would have swallowed us up alive when their anger was kindled against us. Then the flood would have swept us away. The torrent would have gone over us. Then over us would have gone the raging waters. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken, and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In our songs of praise, the Lord, I lift your name on high, and as the people.
Father God, into thy presence, we come this day with joy and thanksgiving as we celebrate the blessing of your presence in and among us. We pray your anointing and blessing upon both gift and giver. And we give you thanks and praise all in Christ, holy name. Money, 
me. <laughs> don't tell them there's rhubarb. Oh, I'm going to. That's how I get my rhubarb. And Galen apparently makes really good jelly. Any others? Any more concerns? Let's no pray. Father God, we thank you that as a church we can keep on. Even during COVID and or small membership church like Trinity, we, we see it when there's not many people in attendance. And so Father, we just pray that you be with those who couldn't be with us. And Lord, to remind us, Lord, that the fear doesn't have to be an option for those who are in you. We're praying, Lord, for those who are hurting, and there's just so much cancer around. We lift up the Grinnell family as they have said their final goodbyes to the Lord. And we're praying, Lord, that you be with Kathy as she continues to battle with cancer. We're praying, Lord, that you be with those who support her, Lord, their strength, and and Lord, their, their best wishes might be sorely felt. We also pray, Lord, your healing hand be upon Kathy, but also Dawn Vaughn and, and Dawn. All of these we ask in the name of Christ our Lord. And now we pray together in the prayer of Jesus, Father, us praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And our hymn is, He Leadeth Me a Muslim Walk.
Either this year or last. <laughs> That's the most life I've seen none of you guys today. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Um, second lesson is from Esther, chapter 7. So the king and Haman went into the feast with Queen Esther. On the second day, as they were drinking wine, the king again said to Esther, What is your petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you. What is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom it shall be fulfilled. And Queen Esther answered, If I have won your favor, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given me. This that is my petition, and the lives of my people, that is my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. If we had been merely sold as slaves, men and women, I would have held my peace, but no enemy can compensate for this damage to the king. Then King Asher said to Queen Esther, Who is he, and where is he, who is presumed to do this? And Esther said, A fallen enemy of this wicked Haman. And Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. The king rose from the feast in wrath and went into the palace garden, but Haman stayed to beg his life from Queen Esther, for he saw the king and determined to destroy him. When the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman had thrown himself on the couch where Esther was reclining. And the king said, Leave and assault the queen in my presence in my own house. As the words left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. And Arwana, one of the eunuchs, Attendants on the king said, Look, the very gallows of Haman has prepared for Mordecai, whose word saved the king, stands in Haman's house, fifty cubits high. The king said, Hang on that. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he prepared for Mordecai. Then the anger of the king abated. Have you wondered how people who, who don't know the Lord handle life? I have. And as a pastor, I can tell you when I officiate the funeral of a person whose family does not have a close relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, there is a marked difference between that family and one who, who does know the Lord. That's not to say there isn't grief when a life is snatched away. There is. There always is. When somebody dies or is injured or is going through a really rough time, a very real part of our life is basically snatched away. Now, make no mistake about it. Um, the, the sun shines on the good as well as the evil. And the rain falls on the just as well as the unjust. There is nothing, however, that is going to happen to us that can't and won't happen to other people. Um, that's uh, Paul puts it in his first letter to the Corinthians. He says, No temptation is taken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able with the temptation, will provide a way of escape also that you may be able to endure it. Now, that promise that we need to hold on to that, that Paul is up here, as well as in this place, as well as many other in scriptures, is that. God is faithful, and God will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we're able, but with the temptation will uh, provide the way of escape also. One of my greatest temptations, of course, is the donut wall up at Walmart. But you notice there's all kind of alleyways leading out away from the place, right? And another way God allows me to escape temptation, all the good ones are gone by the time I get there. And who wants to eat those chocolate donuts that are like, ugh, you know? I, I like the ones that have that gooey fluff in them, you know, that, that icing, uh, like 30 times more the calories than the regular ones. Uh, those are the kinds I gravitate, but if they're not there, then I'm not tempted as much. You know what I'm saying? God always provides a way for us to escape temptation. Now, I think to put it another way, God is not going to forsake us, no matter what we're going through. God is never going to allow us to fend for ourselves. He will never allow us to go alone. Now, put yourself for a moment in an orphan girl's shoes. I mean, being orphaned, she didn't have much. Her parents were gone. Close relatives were gone. I mean, she used to have an older cousin 
that looked after her, but that all came to an end when there were people in the kingdom in charge of keeping the king happy. They decided you were pretty enough to be included in the king's harem. And the young girl's not even given a vote or a say in that. Now, the queen's first, or the king's first wife, um, Vashti, apparently was a very strikingly handsome woman. She didn't like being paraded around with a bunch of drunken guys, um, pawed on by the king and by his guests. Uh, and so she refused to come when he wanted to show her off. He wanted her to get all messy up, you know, wearing all the, the palace jewels and all that, uh, so he could show her off because she was, you know, of course, a, a thing of, of beauty. And uh, she just said, no. Well, in order to save face, the king ends up divorcing her. And that's where the young orphan girl and the, you know, the harem all come in. Not only had the king put away his beautiful wife, but there's something else going on as well. You can't get the history book open to, to sort of figure it out. But at this time, King Asherus was at war. Now, if you watch the history station, have you ever seen the story about the 300? Um, this is basically that, which they, they talk about. In Salamis, the king and his army basically got whooped by the Greeks. And so he had to be a hasty retreat. And he comes home nursing his defeat, but he doesn't have any main woman to go to. For the past four years, it's been four years since he divorced Queen Vashti, our hero, King Asherus, he hasn't got any go-to main woman in his life to go to for encouragement or for comfort. For four years, he just settles for whatever woman, you know, pleases him. He's got socked away in his harem. And so instead of intimacy and companionship, all King Asherus has not only for the past four years basically, excuse me, but one like stands and casual relationships. In the church, we know that's not where true happiness lies. True happiness lies between that intimate relationship between a husband and wife, and that 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 knitting of the souls. Well, he doesn't have that kind of kindred soul relationship with any person on earth. Well, some of the bright guys that he surrounds himself with, um, they come up with a brilliant plan. And I think a kindergartner could have done as well. They said, well, choose for yourself another queen. You know, from the harem, let's open it up. Let's, let's go to the entire you know, kingdom. Let's have a beauty contest. That's what they did. Esther won. Talk about a rags to riches Cinderella story. I mean, this is it. Now, in the meantime, you got this guy in the king's court who is an ancestral enemy of your people. And he has the king, your husband's ear. And so this guy named Haman, he's actually a descendant of King Agag. Uh, he was the king of the Amalekites. If you remember the story, um, King Saul wanted to go to battle, and uh, uh, Samuel didn't show up to bless things, and, and Samuel told him to wait. You know, and he didn't wait. He blessed the stuff himself, and he went. It's literally the act of rebellion that uh, lost him, you know, being king of Israel. But uh, Samuel finally shows up after the battle, and, and God had told him that he was supposed to kill every man, woman, child, every animal. And Samuel shows up, and he hears the bleeding of a sheep, and he says, you know, what, what's this I hear? And so he takes care of what uh, King Saul had, and he killed King Agag on the spot and the sheep and all that stuff. Now, obviously, this man Haman, he's not very fond of Jews. I mean, they remember. And, you know, bloodlust, they could go for generation upon generation. And on top of this, he ends up getting promoted to being the king's right-hand man. And, of course, there was a lot of prestige and honor with that. People were called to bow before him because he was the king's right-hand man. Well, of course, Mordecai, Esther's cousin, the guy who raised her, uh, he's a devout Jew, and he wasn't about to do that. And so Haman hates Mordecai and all the Jews, and he wants to have them all killed. But 
But he hasn't figured out yet that Queen Esther actually is a Jew. And so fixated on getting rid of Mordecai and all the Jews, Haman comes up with what to him seems like a foolproof plan for slaughtering the entire race. Let's get them all done, you know, once. Uh, and he, he convinces King, the king that uh, he's got this security problem in the kingdom. You know, things aren't going well with the Greeks right now. They're on the outside of this border. And uh, Haman says, you've got this group of people that are security risk, and they might gang up, you know, against you with these, you know, Greeks. And so having the threat on the inside as well as on the outside, that's something, you know, King Asher is what going to stand for. And so he says, okay, you know, let's, let's do this. He doesn't even bother asking, you know, who the people are. He just accepts Haman's bribe to kill off this pesky people in his realm he goes off about his business letting Haman, you know, take care of the rest of the details. Well, there's a snag. King Asher is put to sleep at night one time, and so he asked that they bring in the royal, you know, ledger and stuff that talked about the history of the kingdom. And, you know, that would, that's dull enough to put anybody to sleep, right? Does anybody here ever get into reading PPR minutes? Or church council meeting minutes? You know, um, they're, they're sort of like, you know, um, necessary, like, evil thing. Well, he's reading this in order to get put to sleep. And the guy comes up with, uh, a, you know, there was a guy that, you know, piped up out of the memory. He heard there was a plot against your life. People were going to kill you from your inner circle. And he came to us, and, you know, he, he saved you from being killed, King. And uh, he says, we you ever do anything, you know, to honor this guy? And the guy says, no, no, it's nothing's written. Um, so he says, okay. Um, and about that time, this Haman comes walking in, you know, the king's chamber, and he says, hey, what should I do to somebody I want to honor? And Haman's saying, well, it's himself. And so he says, well, make him drive away or ride on your main horse and have the people all come for him. And the king says, that's a great idea. How about if you lead the horse? And I want you to put this, this man Mordecai on the horse and lead him around and have everybody bow. And so, and so things start falling apart. But anyhow, um, Haman had come up with his plan to kill Mordecai and the rest of them. And Queen Esther uh, has a banquet because Mordecai says, you know, you do something now or, you know, you're dead and I'm dead and so is the rest of, you know, our, our uh, countrymen. And so she has a banquet. She invites the king and his honored guest Haman to basically what you and I would think would be a tea party, but they serve something a little bit harder than tea. Well, the king is pleased to get the invitation, and he asks, you know, Queen Esther what he can do for her, for her kindness, and she chickens out. She doesn't have the gumption to sing. She says, uh, 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 how about coming back tomorrow? Let's do this again. And the king is like, yeah, this is pretty cool. And so Haman, you know, they're excited, and so let me pick up the scripture. So the king and Haman went into the feast with Queen Esther, and on the second day as they were drinking wine, the king again said to Esther, what is your petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you what is your request, even the half of my kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. And Queen Esther answered, if I have won your favor, O king, if it pleases the king, let my life be given me. That is my petition. And the laws of my people, that is my request. For we have been sold out of my people to be destroyed, to be killed, to be annihilated, if we had been merely sold as slaves, men and women, I would have held my peace, but no enemy can compensate for this damage to the king. And King Asher said to Queen Esther, Who is he? Where is he? Who is presumed to do this? And Esther said, A foe enemy, this book of Haman. How would you like to be Haman right about now? Uh, did he? Uh, bear in mind, basically, he's got the same fate awaiting him as those who will have nothing to do with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ today. Haman, just like those who refuse to invite the Lord into their life, they are one day going to be toast. There just aren't any other options. Well, our king is not the brightest sky when it comes to interpersonal relationships. But he does recognize that he been duped. Not only by his right-hand man, but also by his queen. Now, obviously, he's angrier at Haman than he is Queen Esther. 
The king rose from the feast and wrath. He went out to the palace guard, but Haman begged to stay to beg for his life when we asked him, for he saw the king and determined to kill him. When the king returned from the palace guard to the back of all, Haman had thrown himself on the couch where Esther was reclining. The king said, Will he even assault a queen in my presence in my own house? At this particular time, uh, Haman didn't have a, a friend in the world. That eunuch named Harbona, he probably could not wait to get the words out of his mouth. Look, the very gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai, whose words saved the king. Stands in Haman's house, fifty cubits high, and the king said, Hang him on that. So they hang Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai, and the anger of the king was made. Now we think of gallows, we think of something like the old west, you know, the hangman noose and like raw wood and all that stuff. Um, that when they hung somebody, that one what they did basically, they stuck them on the show. Just did. Um, uh, it didn't take long to die. It's not like the cross that our Lord was killed on. But they just impaled you on a sharp stick and they die almost immediately. And then they leave you up there as a warning to the rest of the people. Now Isaiah puts it this way. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that accuses you in judgment will you will condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their vindication is from me, the Lord. When we trust in the Lord, no weapon formed against us is going to ultimately prevail. Right now, there is a lot of save rattling going on in America. There's a lot of save rattling going on in other parts of the world, particularly in the Middle East. A lot of nations right now are, are ganging up on Israel. And the reality is they aren't going to fare any better than Haman and his followers. There is not going to be any mercy shown to those who would turn against God and against his, his people. And may God's mercy rest upon the United States of America if we are dumb enough to turn against Israel. Now, according to the 19th chapter of the book of Revelation, our Lord is just merely going to speak the word. And it's all going to go away. The whole thing's going to be over. Trusting in weapons of mass destruction, trusting in more sophisticated weaponry and armor, it's not going to stand a chance against God. Not against His Son when He comes on that white horse. Um, this is what John writes in Revelation. Then I saw heaven opened, and there was a white horse. Its rider is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name inscribed that no one knows but himself. He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, wearing fine linen and white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he'll rule them with a rod of iron. He'll tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name inscribed, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Today, the peoples of the earth have to choose just whom they will serve. Will be God, will be his Son, through whom all dominion, all power, all honor, and glory has been, been granted by God the Father. Or will it be those who are going to be trampled under? In the book of Esther, we are given a very subtle reminder. Those who are not for the king are against the king. And those who are not you know, for him, they are also against his bride. And we are that bride. In our age, in the age to come, we need to know that either we are for the, the lamb and for this bride, or we are against them. And the outcome is going to be the same. Death will claim its prize. And as Paul reminds us, for the wages of sin are death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Now Haman and his sons, they made the wrong decision. They sold out for a bowl of porridge, pretty much just like Esau did. And that's all they got. In the end, they even lost their souls. In what could be the final days, spoken of in scriptures, uh, we need to recognize that many will be those that stand against us just as they stand against God. 
Now, despite all this, may we never lose heart. And may we never be distracted by anything other than you know, what is right and good and totally in keeping with the life in Christ. And along with the psalmist, might we be able to boldly say, Blessed be the Lord who has not given us his prey in their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken, we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, it just seems like everybody is rounding your shade right now. And you are mocked. The ways of your people are put down. But we recognize, Lord, that there's no other option. You will win that war. And we will be Tenants of your side. Give us the strength. We plead for your mercy. And we ask the Lord for an awareness, constant awareness in your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And our hymn is page 591.
Thank you.